so I think we'll um, we'll get going. Hi. <laughs> um, well, for the one person I don't think I've met formally, though, I've really met in June, I'm Diane Hirschberg. <laughs> and I'm the director of paper and also faculty here at ISER. And um, thank you all for coming. Um, before we get started with introducing our speaker, just a, a couple of safety notes, which I bet Gunnar doesn't do at the start. But if um, for some reason it starts shaking or there's a fire alarm, you head through that door and there is a stair on the um, far side of the elevator. You want to go out that one because it takes you straight out the building and it's one of those safe staircases. Um, bathrooms are also just out that door and then to the left. Um, any other personal needs, we'll have to talk afterwards. Um, this is a um, Center for Alaska Education Policy Research Lunchtime Talk, but done in collaboration with ICER. So we have separate mailing lists that sometimes we send to both and sometimes we don't. So if you want to be on both lists, you want to make sure to email paper and also um, sign up on the form that's on ICER's website. And then one last announcement, um, if you got this off of paper, Next week we have a, a, or if you didn't, next week we have another talk on Friday from Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer Shaw, who's going to be talking about navigating at a double crossroads the role of subsistence in the well-being of Denina Athabasca youth. And um, Jen is talking about um, basically the role of subsistence and in, in how these young people um, perceive their, their well-being. Uh, and that is next Friday, also at noon. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Reinhold Sackman. I am, hopefully, I should have asked you um, how to pronounce Is it Halle or Hal? Halle. Halle. So he is a, a, a professor of sociology from the Martin Luther University of Halle, Wittenberg, in Germany, and has been a visiting professor at UAA for a couple months now? No, a couple of weeks. Oh, a couple of weeks. Anyway, so um, uh, sociology was generous enough to share him with us, and I'm going to let um, Dr. Sackman complete his introduction and, and start his talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation, Diane. Uh, topic today for me is post-growth societies, education systems, and differentiation. It will be a quite straightforward talk. Uh, We'll start with a short introduction what post-growth society means in this context. I will uh, specify the research question, then move on to more or less theories and hypotheses, how to explain things, and then show empirical data on the thing, quantitative data, and have a discussion at the end. So it's very much an article-like uh, presentation. If we talk about Post-growth society, it's useful, I think, to look back about 40 years ago with the famous book for the Club of Rome, Limits to Growth, uh, which was very important in the German context, triggering off a kind of ecological movement there, foundation of the Green Party. I think it was also quite influential in the US mm -hmm. at that time, if one looks into the book now, one sees, well, the theory is quite thin of it. It's more or less a neo-Malthusian concept, very much growing population is taking away the resources, and the resources are short then. Uh, in looking at this book, what one can do about it, it's also quite vague. It's just saying, well, think about growth ideology and think about alternatives and then it's the ending point. If you look at the situation at present, we see that the population isn't growing so much at the world level as it did in the 70s. Uh, if uh, to people familiar with the concept of demographic transition, one could say that I mean, that uh, we are moving in now from phase three to phase four. That is, the, the growth rate is rapidly declining now. That's the situation on world level. If you look 
at the specificities, we see something which is quite new and which wasn't a, an only agenda in the 70s. We have now a couple of countries with a declining population. That is quite new. We have a growing population now since about 300 years, rapidly growing, but now some countries show up that are declining in numbers. Japan is an example. Germany in the last decade was an example with a couple of East European countries like Romania, Hungary at the moment. And the likelihood that this number of countries will grow in the next decades is quite high. If we look at a regional level, the development is also quite strong. There are large parts in Germany, East Germany, for example, but also uh, some parts in West Germany which have a declining population. Most parts of Japan outside the big cities have a declining population. Even some parts in New Zealand, but Alaska wasn't a good case for me. Uh, I only saw around about 11 remote boroughs with a declining population. I'm interested why that is the pattern here. Uh, I find quite interesting a concept brought up by a New Zealand demographer Natalie Jackson who said that well at the start of uh, changing fertility patterns at the end 19th century beginning of the 20th century we had increasing regional difference the process starting in the cities and then moved decades later on uh, to the towns and it might be that with a change of a pattern towards decreasing population numbers which will not start on a world level at, until the end of the century we have a similar pattern now emerging that the regional difference is growing that the new pattern is more on the remote areas and the cities are kept aside but it moves into the city uh, with growing uh, process. So that is more or less the background post-growth society here in a very narrow sense just on population centered. There might have been better in Alaska to talk about resources and oil peak, but I have no, idea, uh, <laughs> no knowledge on, on it, so you have to take up this population. The precise form of my research question was, do changes in the size of population increase the likelihood of changes in the kind of differentiation? To see the, the background of this question, one has to look at the debate we had in Germany during the last, say, 15 years as population declining was coming up to the agenda. Uh, we had one position which was quite prominent that simply stated demography's destiny and it has a really bleak perspective with a decreasing population, we lose vital resources, what can we do about it? Nothing. So that is one position. The opposite position that is also quite strong in public discourse and scientific literature, it simply states demography is just a kind of talking about things and it is more or less covering up other interests. Our position is some way in between. We think that demography is an important issue, but we think that societies can cope with it. So we are looking how society can cope with the new situation and what are there on ways to uh, get along with this new phenomenon. We had a grant on this project running for about three years, uh, looking at coping with this demographic change in the education system. Uh, there will be coming out a book at we hope at the end of the year with Springer, an English book. Uh, I just show one aspect of the whole project. I'm looking today only on secondary education, 
We also did work on other forms of education, so if you're interested in this, just ask in the discussion part of the presentation. Secondary school systems in Germany are about quite different from the S, and it's always difficult to translate terms here. So uh, I'm telling you what sometimes is showing up in the uh, dictionaries, but the, even the dictionaries are not precise in this point. So the usual thing is that in West Germany, a system called tripartite school system is the main system. You have on the lower level a main school. You have something in between that's an intermediate school. And on top, you have grammar school. That is the classic form. Uh, you had experiments with alternative systems, as you know them, comprehensive schools with discussions in the 1970s and things start getting started there in West Germany. We had an introduced comprehensive school system in communist East Germany, which ran up till 1990. That is the second part. And you, we have a new forms starting in the 1990s with schools with several educational programs, as they are called, which integrate main and intermediate school and leave grammar school outside. These forms we have mainly in East Germany. Later on in the data, I will show uh, a last form of school type that is called Waldorf schools, mm -hmm. Rudolf Steiner schools. Uh, mm -hmm. You have something similar here. Mm -hmm. That's private school with a certain type of pedagogic that we also have in Germany. Not so often, but uh, spread around the country. If you think about the phenomena, <coughs> how to explain school type change, we were um, getting into the issue with four kinds of theories. The first thing is, as you all know, this path dependence theory. Uh, if you look at the process, we find, uh, on the one hand, coming in from world society level, as shown by concepts by Maya and uh, people like that, that there is a isomorphic tendency that the cultural legitimacy of certain types of forms is growing in, and that is comprehensive schools since the 1960s. And this process was also coming in to Germany, as I already mentioned. There were efforts to introduce the system, but these efforts were not successful. And why are they not successful? One main issue. Uh, there, I think, is path dependency. We had a lot of resistance coming from, on the one hand, teachers' organizations, some part of the teachers' organizations, and from parents, some parts of the parents. And there was a strong polarization of political parties on this issue. So that was highly controversial. And it was more or less successful in mobilizing against change. Uh, interesting in this respect is also the situation at the reunification in 1990. As I already mentioned, we had a well-established comprehensive school system in East Germany, but the West German system of a tripartite school system was taken over without great discussion. So one hypothesis is simply there will be no change. The second theory on it is well, change is affected by political reform. And political reform, we call it loud change. That is something we have always some kind of discourse before, before it. And then we have collectively binding decisions. We had these discussions in the 70s, as I already mentioned. But we had, we had no discussions in the early 90s, as I already mentioned. But the discussion was coming up again uh, after 2000. Uh, in Germany, the PISA study by the OECD was quite influential. 
and PISA study for the discussion on comprehensive schools had two different empirical findings. On the one hand, with international comparison, the leading countries like Finland had a comprehensive school system. So there was a discussion that international comparison shows that comprehensive schools are better. But results within Germany comparing states and the, the school system in Germany is that the states govern education showed that the states with the most traditional concepts of education, like Bavarian, Baden-Württemberg, had the highest level of education achievement. And countries with uh, states with some part of comprehensive schools did less well. So it was a mixed empirical situation, but there was discussions coming up. And the form to compromise on this was that there was a number of reform initiatives that prolonged primary school. And primary school is not uh, partitioned, so it's more or less not getting into secondary school system, change things, but change things in that, that the secondary school system starts later, which is still quite young for American mm -hmm. uh, audience, I think. Uh, separating uh, pupil at age 12 is already quite young, but the traditional pattern is separating children at age 10. So that's two years. If you have political reform initiatives, usually the situation is that it is quite loud at the decision point, but the effects later on are rarely discussed. In looking at this point, which you later want uh, to take up, one has to always to think about non-intended effects that will show up later on. So the hypothesis too would be that we have less school types due to political reforms. The thought theory I want to look on, and that was the heavy bet we had, was uh, silent change following demographic change. We were um, heavily looking on theories to explain how this process of demographic change influences things, as I already mentioned. Because in the current debate, you have mainly more or less empirical, practical advices, but not real theories on it. So in a bit of despair, we turned back the clock and went to the late 19th century to get some theories, because at that point of time, there was a huge change of demographic situations. And we have theories around that. And one theory around that is Durkheim, which seemed for us interesting, as he says, that if you have a higher population, not only if you have a higher population, but if you have more interaction of a growing population, then there will be a rise of competition. This form is quite similar to Malthusian thinking, but putting in there the interaction point as well. But then it goes on, societies at this point are not forced to live with the competition, but they sometimes move into a situation that they increase the division of labor to increase the differentiation, and by that way, take off a bit of the competitive situation as people are in different uh, packs, more or less, without competing. So that is the Durkheim theory. Uh, the theory is a bit uh, uh, disputed in secondary literature. We find empirical um, foundation of it in studies by Casada, for example. We also find uh, empirical 
strengthening of the thesis in newer discussions on world society and its effects on competition, like in Munch, for example. But we also find, especially in theoretical literature, uh, the, the, the trial to get off the Durkheimian uh, theory. Uh, at that point, uh, we have an influential article by, oh, the pronunciation is there difficult for me because it's in German immigrant to uh, America. I can pronounce it the German way, then it's Ruschemeyer. If I pronounce it in American way, it's, I think, Ruschemeyer or something. Ruschemeyer. Ruschemeyer, okay. Uh, he stated that um, Durkheim is too naturalistic in his conception of differentiation process. There's a symbolic process in between, there's construction of differentiation, and so he misses the point about differentiation. Schimpank is also arguing a bit more differentiated at this point, but he also sets in that we have something in between in conceptualizing before population has effects. Um, if you're interested in that point, we can also look at economic theory on this point because it's strengthening the risk mile point, I would think. For us, the interesting point was, well, if Durkheim said it's happening with a growing population, might it be happening with a decreasing population as well? So if you have less population, less interaction, is there less competition? And is there a way in reducing the effect of these processes by lowering the degree of division of labor, of differentiation to cope with this situation? So that was the third point we were trying to make. Does a decreasing population sometimes lead to less school times? That was what we were interested in. The third, fourth point was also on demography. Sometimes demographers uh, talk about demography only with reference to fertility and mortality but they leave out migration, but migration is an important part of the picture at present national populations. So we're also looking on a process that sometimes is called, with a catchword in Germany now, the population is getting more colorful, which is another word for that it is getting more ethnic heterogeneous. Uh, with this context of education system, there was some statement at the far off point that said that maybe the comprehensive school system introduced there changed its meaning. It was started in Germany, at least in Germany, it started as an alternative to the tripartite system, but it established maybe itself more as an additional school type. And this additional school type is quite used by immigrants and it helps immigrants to integrate into the German school system better than in other parts of the school system. So the fourth hypothesis is if we get a higher proportion of pupils with migration background, we find more school types. So this is more or less the theoretical background we were using. Our data sets were regional data, official regional data on this issue on a county level, county and municipalities. Uh, and for the time between 1995 till 2010, so we have a time series there with 6,512 observations at 60 points of time. Uh, we used a panel regression. I will show you today the results of the random effects model, but we also did calculations with the fixed effect models and uh, hybrid effect models. They're quite similar, and you can look it up in the article uh, to see the other results if you're interested in that.
We had the problem to get an idea how to measure differentiation. And the way we measured differentiation was by an index on the effective number of school types. That is an index that mixes on the one side what forms of school types are in a county and combines this with a measure of the proportion of pupils in the school types. This kind of measuring differentiation was first developed in, uh, in forms to measure biodiversity in the 1970s, but it was also used by political scientists on measuring uh, situations in multi-party election systems. It seemed for us useful to use it for our school question. Uh, we have six possible school types in the counties from our data. So the maximum level of this effective number would be six. And if there's only one school type, the minimum number would be one. Uh, I show you three examples to get a feeling about the index. Um, there are three counties shown here, the one with the lowest number of the index, the median number, and the maximum number. And you see here what makes the minimum. We have here County Schweinfurt that has just <coughs> two school types, and 92% are in the main school. So that is very much centered on one school type. You see here what is a maximum level, Kaiserslautern. We have here all six school types that are in the data set. And you see that in, four, uh, in five school types, the distribution of pupils is nearly equal. Just the, just the Waldorf school is, is very much lower figures, but all the other forms are really similar. So that is a high number of school types then. <laughs> I turn on now to the results. And I first show the descriptive results. The descriptive <coughs> results here show this effective number of school forms. You see here the median. And you see it with reference to the German states. If you look at the process with reference to the German states, one can say that the median is decreasing a bit. And the variance is also decreasing a bit. If you look at the county situation, it is not so clear the number is from the median, not so much decreasing. But you see here that the variance is decreasing. So the system is moving slowly a bit towards less school types. And the variance of this process is decreasing. If you look more specifically which school types show up in the counties. One gets a picture by this uh, graph. You see on the top line here these dashes, and these show grammar schools. Grammar schools are in all counties in Germany, with the exception of two counties. So that is a pattern that didn't change. But we see change below that, the number of counties with the main school and the number of counties with an intermediate school is decreasing. And you see, on the other hand, that the number of counties with schools with several education programs is increasing, as well as the number with Waldorf schools as well as the number with slighter, but also with comprehensive schools, is increasing. 
So the process is more driven, one could say, by changes in the lower and middle level than by the top level. If we look at the multivariate analysis, I will first show the determinants of the population uh, thing we were interested in. Uh, one can say that about 10% of the variance is explained by population number of uh, youth in this school age and population density. Um, we were looking whether this result is keeping up if we put in control levels, uh, control variables, and we see that population number stays important, but population density is not important for this process. Uh, if we look at the numbers, the bold types are significant results on the one percent level. The uh, results without both types are not significant with respect to this. The second demographic um, variable we tested were the share of foreign students in the county. And one sees that if the share of foreign students is higher, the number of school types is higher. So that is according to our hypothesis. Quite Surprising for us is that if social democrats are in government in the states, social democrats were a lot of campaigning during the last decades for comprehensive schools, the number of school types is increasing. It's not decreasing, which one would think would happen, but it's increasing. So one could say this is a non-intended effect of the political reforms. They try to move a more similar school type system in, but they resulted more in a more differentiated school type system. May I ask a yeah, sure. clarification question? Is, what, to what degree is their choice versus placement based on an exam for the different school types? It's choice. It is uh, no, no, it, no, no, it's yeah. mixed. It's a mixture. It's a mixture. <laughs> School it's systems are difficult. Yes. Uh, in the 1970s, in most German states, it was teachers who decided in which track pupils go. Um, they decided not on their own. They give a kind of evaluation, what school type they would suggest. And if parents didn't agree, uh, the pupils had to take extra exams to move in. But at the 70s, there started uh, a different school differentiation process system, which is now in place in most German states. That is, uh, parents can decide on their own. And then one sees what happens. So we have both systems. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so the grammar school would be the more academic track. Uh, yeah. And what's the difference between what you call the main school and the comprehensive school? Comprehensive school is, is is with, it's like high school. You have everything in one school. In, uh, you, you, I think you, you, you meant main school and inter intermediate school. So do you mean main like elementary school? Right. No, no main. Uh, in Germany, it's called Hauptschule. That was uh, in former time, times the, the main school for everybody. So, and in the 50s, we had still about 80, 90% in this form. Nowadays, it's the form of school that leads to apprenticeship vocational and training. vocational training and things like that. Yeah. In the comprehensive school, those are just 
Comprehensive schools can lead to everything. This is a, a technical question. I noticed in this slide and the previous one that your equation is not explaining much of the variance within each group. So yep. is that that is that over time the way you define it? Yep. And and it seems to me that you have population or share affordance students possibly with a trend over time. And uh, and I saw when you showed the, the, the proportion of students in different programs, you have an upward trend in, in many of these school types over time. So I'm wondering if you had tried just putting in a time trend in this equation and if that would have changed any of your results, just a, like a variable for the year. Technical questions are always difficult to answer, <laughs> but um, you're right. With the random effects model, the within effect is time related. So, and we have effects that are stronger in the between. Uh, You've explained much more of the variation from one, I guess, county or yeah. district to another. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, the, the random effect models mixes both. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that we also did a fixed effect model, which is only looking at yeah. changes in time. The only difference between the two is how it deals with the unexplained variation. Uh, and so they both have the same potential problem of confounding effects over time. So anyway, just something I suggest you might just try and see if that makes any difference. You just put in a variable that's just the year yeah. in all your equations and see which of these coefficients are don't change much and which yeah. of them change quite yeah. a bit. That would yeah. be instructive, I think. Well, might be an idea. Um, Okay, I talked about the social democrats. Mm -hmm. um, the point of territorial location was for us interesting as uh, I already mentioned before that school types are a bit different in East Germany from West Germany. And as this process started already in the 19, early 1990s, we couldn't put it in as a time variant variable. So this is more or less the, the cause why we moved into the random effects model because we had a time constant variable that we wanted to have in the equation because it is important. And you see here that it is quite important that the number of school types in East Germany is nearly one type less than in uh, West Germany. Um, we also put in to uh, time uh, time changing variables of reforms within this interval of 1995 to 2010. There were some political reforms. The one kind of reform is combining main with intermediate school. And this has the effect as intended. The number of school types is decreasing. And the other type of reform was more or less introducing new comprehensive school systems. And we have also here the effect already uh, yeah, suggested with the Social Democrats effect that is more or less uh, increasing the number of school types. But I wouldn't bet too much on this effect yet because uh, the, the reforms here were introduced in 2010 mostly, so in our data set it doesn't, it isn't so good in, in different in this point. So to get to a summary, one can say that we mainly find 
stability of number of school times. So path dependency is still quite important in Germany. So we have a slight change, but not a revolutionary change here. The second thing is we find that cloud changes in form of political reforms are important, but they have sometimes non-intended effects, like what we saw with the Social Democrats and their mm -hmm. comprehensive schools, which more add to the system than reduce the complexity of the system. We find the silent change of a decreasing population that furthers less school types. That was the interesting point for us. And that might be also politically important because it's sometimes changing political polarization as some parts of the conservative party living in smaller, less densely populated areas are now getting interested in integrated school system, which they weren't before. So, and we have also uh, a, a movement from demographic processes with more colorful, more et uh, ethnic, uh, heterogeneous population that is moving more in more differentiation. So we have from this effect uh, processes moving in both directions. If we want to evaluate this um, effect of, of the uh, degree of differentiation uh, as a, an instrument for coping with demographic change, the practical side we were interested in, one can say um, that it is a way to damp negative effects of demographic change especially for sparsely populated areas, but that is sparsely populated within German context. So uh, with Alaskan uh, comparison, it's, high I density. think, high density. <laughs> not highest density, not Anchorage everywhere, but mostly high density. So the situation there is a bit different. Why is it something that is interesting? Well, if you don't reduce differentiation, you either have higher costs per pupil, if you keep up the system, or if you close schools, and a lot of schools were closed in Germany during the last two decades, you have uh, problems with the reachable distance of pupils moving to schools. And some results show that if you keep schools within counties, the social integration is high if you always, uh, as in the situation, if you always bus pupils around, uh, that is not so good for integration. However, and that I think is also important coming from this Durkheim perspective, the effect of population density on these forms of differentiation is not an automatic effect. It is due to doing something. So this has to be an effort, but it also has transaction costs. If you introduce new forms of organizations or new forms of institutions, you always have transaction costs. So it is not something you get for granted. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to your comments and questions. And a share of the foreign population uh, variable that you have in your regression. That's been interpreted as essentially counties with a higher share of foreign students have more uh, differentiated schools or more, uh, a larger number of schools. Obviously, there is quite a bit of self selection there, right? And so foreign students or foreign families could be moving towards counties that have more differentiated types of schools because they cater to them, right? And so there is a, a little bit of, a, of an endogeneity concern as to what that variable actually means. Uh, the second thing related to that social demographic ruling party, 
I think what you're capturing there is the contemporaneous relationship between who's in office and the types of schools that are there. And so it could be that the change is happening when the the other party, whatever you call it, or the reference category makes the change, and then we're capturing correlation that's contemporaneous between the, the Democratic Party and then the number of the schools. And so I don't know whether you've thought about doing something like the duration of time that the, the, the Democratic Party has spent out of the 16 years in your analysis. That way you get a sense of how important is the Social Democratic Party in a specific county relative to the benchmark. Mm -hmm. With regard to your first question, self-selection of ethnic population moving in, I wouldn't believe you from the social process behind it. Because if you look at the social process behind it, it's more the autochthonous population which is doing something. There's a lot of debate in Germany, a bit of parents, paranoia, if the school has a high uh, percentage of foreign pupils, they try to move out of the school. So it's more that this triggers a process of differentiation and the schools are used for it. There are different forms of schools used for it, and that is the important thing there in uh, states with less school types. The concentration is more than that foreign students, some the groups of foreign students is quite different, so we would have to talk about different groups, but I don't talk about that now. But the main part of uh, foreign students is concentrating in main school then, that is the traditional pattern, but if you have comprehensive schools, the concentration is more in comprehensive schools, and that is better for the perspectives of immigrants, and that is used by them. So you, you're right in the last point, as immigrants use the system for them as well, but there's also a strong point of it that in the interaction of the different groups, the, the autochthonous population is an actor in this process. So I wouldn't say it's self-selection. No, I'm saying that econometrically speaking, yeah. that's a concern. Now, you may have subsamples in your groups, and so you, can, you have thresholds that you're yeah. essentially talking about, yeah. where if I have more than 15% yeah. foreign students, yeah. then yeah. the natives are going to yeah. start moving out, or vice versa. Yeah. And so, that can be leveraged and okay. in in creating subsamples where you're making the case. I mean, I okay. believe you because you're more familiar with how Germany operates and how, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. how people respond to yeah. to these potential incentives. But okay, no thresholds would have been an alternative, but I, I don't think so. thresholds would be more or less putting in something artificial and say that's the point. Of, uh, your second point on the duration. Um, our modeling was we, it's time series, and we, at the point when Social Democrats were in government, it was marked as form. Um, you say now that the effects will show up later that is has some some truth in it I would say but um, there is a kind of polarization of the German state system you have some states which had largely conservative governments during the last two decades and we have a subset of states which have largely a social democrat uh, uh, so you have a point, the proportion would have also be used. Um, yeah. Yeah. I have uh, kind of qualitative questions. One is that, um, so 
if the differentiation is happening, especially when there is a higher percentage of you know, foreign students are in the county, then does that result in sort of a popular consciousness about these are sort of the lower tier schools? You know, so gymnasiums are still the, the best one. Everybody's trying to go to that, but immigrants end up in these other places that are not going to take them to the university route. So in that sense, even though they may be increasing and supposedly integrating more, but does that mean it's less successful and therefore not as respected or desired? And related to that is, as the uh, communities now have second and third generation parents, maybe, now they know a little bit more than the first generation parents about the school system. So are they navigating it a little differently for their children? Because one of the things that, from the first generation, I know they didn't even know that their kids coded gymnasium that they can go back to the teacher and say no and so they just get tracked into these vocational schools most of the time for Turkish students especially. So is that changing? That's an interesting question and a quite complicated question. I already mentioned that immigrant groups are quite different with regard to education. We have immigrant groups who are doing better than Germans in the German education system Vietnamese, for example, which are the dominant group of immigrants in East Germany are doing better than Germans. And we have uh, groups that do fairly even to Germans like Russians and Chinese. And we have um, Greek people, but we have two groups of immigrants that do uh, far less well in the German system. And these are Italians and Turks. The public debate only concentrates on Turks. Italians are nice, you know, everyone knows. <laughs> so my guess would be there's always one group to pick on, and that is in Germany, the Turks. And if you look how this is processed in the education system, you find on the one hand that the traditional pattern in Germany was that the concept was not on integrating foreigners by education. That is quite strange, I think, for the US context, as in the US always education was seen as a main integration part of immigration. It wasn't thought of in Germany a long time. So, uh, the education system for a number of decades mainly resulted in putting the especially Italians and Turks in the lower levels of the education system. And at the lower level of education system, we have in Germany two ways of entry. The one is to go directly to work. And that was the traditional pattern of the employment of immigrants in Germany. But this pattern was getting more and more complicated. So the main part was now, are they getting into vocational training? And vocational training is, on the one hand, discriminating against immigrants, because at the point as the vocational training was getting uh, a bit lower in the degrees, they put in a system that turned them around and set them for one, two years waiting for things. But the aspirations of immigrants at this form of integration was quite low. So the conflicts were not very high. And after some times, they usually got into vocational training and they were integrated. There are interesting comparisons with France because France has a different system. They integrate immigrants by the educational system, but the educational system is very much oriented towards academic training. So immigrants there are doing very well in education, but they don't get jobs. Yeah. because they are discriminated against them. And in this experience, their aspiration is far higher than 
of German immigrant youth and the feeling of discrimination is far higher in France than it is in Germany. My guess would be that, and data in this direction show it, I think that the success of integrating immigrants by the German school system is increasing as immigrants are getting smarter and as the education system is getting smarter, I think, but also the feeling of discrimination will increase as the aspirations are growing. The long answer to the short question. That's okay, thank you. Yeah. <coughs> well, we're actually at one o'clock, so um, people can say if you want to have an informal conversation. But I'd like to uh, thank our speaker, Dr. Sackman, again. And thank you.